Science has changed a lot. And, but, you know, one of the things that uh, I've heard about Brown is this ability to cross lines. And that's one of the things that's obviously really important about making progress in science. And uh, since I'm going to talk a bit about this, because I'm going to talk about mechanism design. And uh, sort of midway through my career, some computer scientists got interested in this. When I thought about it, gee, that made a lot of sense. But when we were doing it, we certainly, when we were originating all this work, we certainly never thought about it that way. We never thought computer scientists uh, would get interested in it. You know, we found it interesting, which is why we did it. And we were delighted, of course, that other people found it interesting. So what I want to talk about, uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, designing economic institutions. You know, I'm going to talk about mechanism design and then take it all the way to um, you know, a, recent, a very recent uh, proposal as to how do we form uh, some security markets, so, you know, uh, identify a particular uh, inefficiency that uh, appears to be important in the way security markets are organized, and show you that inefficiency, and show you why a particular proposal might work. You know, end up by discussing that word might, too, because we are quite to the point of where we know that it would work. These things are hard. <laughs> now, but let me start out by talking about a little bit, because this is, you know, a variety of an audience, uh, about institutions uh, and uh, markets. Now, every institution has uh, a structure, you know, when you apply to college, you know, there's deadlines to do it, and then they prevaricate about it, read your stuff, they get the recommendations, and then send out offers and you've got to reply by a certain time and then there's the waiting list and all these things. And, you know, and how did that come about? Well, it kind of came out about like topsy. Same thing happened in of course in securities markets. And you know, legend says that the New York Stock Exchange started under a buttonwood tree down on Wall Street two hundred some uh, years ago where a bunch of people stood around. And you know, and what happened, you know, is you learned if you wanted to buy securities or sell securities, you know, head down to Wall Street and talk to, uh, talk to these people. We started holding inventories of that security and, you know, and it was very natural how it came about, you know. I'd go talk to Vince Crawford here because he, he, he specialized in a particular uh, uh, security and, you know, he'd be glad to sell me some of it at a high price, but if I, of course, if I wanted to uh, 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 sell to him, for his inventory, he'd, uh, he'd give me a lower price. And, you know, he made his living off that uh, spread. We'll talk about things like that. The Chicago, uh, in the New York Stock Exchange, out of that came up with a system of specialists, which is almost dead now because of le electronic trading. Uh, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and the Chicago Board of Trade came up with this overnight outcry system where you stand around in a pit and yell at each other. You know, if I meet, uh, you know, uh, Freeman's eyes, you know, and and he nods at me. We've got to trade, and uh, we both know it, and we fill out our little cards and hand it in. Now, you know, the details is how we run these markets can make a real difference, and uh, you know, maybe, you know, I, I frankly don't know which one of those things was more, uh, more efficient. I don't think anybody really. Uh, uh, really knows which of those organizations. And you know, what I want to talk about is, you know, how can we think about institutions and optimize these situ uh, institutions? You know, we want to make the institution a variable which we maximize over. And we're going to have a whole bunch of constraints. And uh, these constraints are hard to take care of mathematically. We didn't know how to do this for a long time. And how that came about. Um, and um, in particular, you know, a deep and fundamental problem is everybody in this room has thoughts. And I don't know what any of you are thinking about right now. You know, I'm sure some of you are thinking about what you're going to do tonight for dinner. And others are trying to think about what this guy is saying up front. Uh, you know, I can't tell. Uh, we've all gotten good at looking interested in things. 
<laughs> you know, so this private information that we each have about ourselves, our preferences, is just a real ubiquitous thing. And that's going to show up in a very simple way in, uh, in the work that I'm going to talk about, which is, you know, how much do you value something? I'm going to talk about security markets. Uh, actually, I'm not terribly interested in them, you know. I've been the last few days trying to get straight, you know, what's a bid, what's an ask, and all these things. <laughs> but they were an interesting institution, you know, not a trade, uh, but it's an interesting economic institution which have tools at this stage are pretty good at working uh, uh, with other institutions we like to work on, but we aren't good enough to do it. Uh, 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 yeah. So anyway, I'm going to try, you know, the essential part of uh, uh, the incomplete information, as we say, you know, that each of us do not have complete information, is that we don't know about each other's preferences. You can't tell how much I value a share of IBM stock, and I can't tell how much you value it. And if we're going to trade that uh, stock, if you're going to buy from me, you only, you know, that trade only makes sense if you value it more than I do. How are we going to learn that? How are we going to come about uh, trading? And we'll talk about that. And can we make this trading efficient so that whenever you value that share of IBM stock more than me, that we will actually trade? And so, you know, so we're talking about a market where we're trying to match up individuals with each share so that. Those people who end up owning the shares are those who most value it. And those of us who don't end up owning it, who sold it or never had it or whatever, are those who value it less. And somehow we kind of get the information, that people to reveal that information accurately in some sense. And that's the problem I'm talking about. And it matters what rules that we use. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, you know, the basic idea that I have. So I'm going to be talking, uh, I'm going to be talking about, uh, uh, you know, mechanism design. So we're going to need an objective function, and we'll have a pretty simple one here. We're going to have to specify what preferences people have. In other words, your valuations an example that I'm going to use. Then I'm going to have to specify a bunch of constraints. And those constraints, the most important ones, but far from the only ones, will be that uh, you will somehow reveal your information. And uh, you know, sort of the central story that you will reveal it accurately. accurately. And then we've got to somehow specify what's the range of institutions that we can do, you know? You don't know what you're maximizing over, you can't really maximize very well. So we've got to have a class of possible mechanisms. And then lastly, I'm not going to speak a whole lot about it, I'll speak a little bit, I we'll talk more about it today. We'll have to think of what's the equilibrium concept that we're going to use. In other words, we need a way of predicting what people uh, will do, given their information, given what other people are doing, and what the rules of the game uh, are. And once we've got that whole set up, we're just going to pick from the possible mechanisms that maximize our, 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 our our, our objective function. There we have it. We have an optimal uh, mechanism. Now, a guiding principle that you know, and computer science comes in here, and why computer scientists have got an interest in this, is we've got to respect people's private information and their preferences. You know, you can't get around it. You can't make people tell you the truth. Uh, even if the CIA did think they should for a while. Um, and, uh, you know, and so we have to, you know, we have to set things up so that people will be willing to tell the truth, that they will be willing to participate in the trade, uh, in the set of, uh, you know, the institutions that we set up. And computer scientists, you know, originally when you programmed a computer, you know, it was pretty straightforward to follow your instructions. Then we started making distributed systems where, you know, I might be doing something, putting input in, <coughs> and you're putting input in, and somehow or another we're interacting, you know, playing a video game or whatever, that is, multiplayers, and, uh, 
And suddenly, you know, gee, I want you to play it a certain way as I design the game. But you're doing what you want in order to beat me in that game type of thing. We have to face that squarely. And good scientists are simply worried about it a great deal. Um, but I'm glad to say, I think about it probably in the terms that we've uh, that we thought about it too as economists. That's really great fun. It's fun. Now, <clears throat> let me give a little preview of the whole talk. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm going to focus on the trade of a single security. And people will only hold one share of it or no shares. Keeping it simple. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we've got the diversity of preferences. You might not value it very much. Uh, I might value it a lot. You know, then you and I should trade together uh, uh, type of thing. But remember, that information is hidden from each other. You've got beliefs about what I might value it, and I have beliefs about you, but we don't know. Uh, and so the goal is to assign the securities to the most, the people who most value it. And I'm going to take us through in a logical sequence. I'll start by talking about mechanism design of a very simple problem, uh, which is one object, two people. We can't divide the object. One person has the object. And the question is, will it get sold to the other person? So I've got the object. You're the seller type of thing. And we're going to talk about how we can trade it. I'll uh, show you how we can derive the optimal mechanism on that. And uh, you know, it actually relate, not prove, uh, you know, an important uh, theorem, an interesting theorem, I think. I'll give you some intuition on it. Then, you know, so that's the bilateral trading pro uh, uh, problem. Then we're going to generalize that to lots of people, like in the security market. You know, 1,000 people on each side of the market, 1,000 shares that we have to sort somehow get to the right people. And I'll show you some theorems about that, too. Um, and that'll give us a basis. And particularly, I'm going to give a conjecture, which I think is true. You know, that's why you make conjectures. But I certainly haven't proven it yet. Uh, but I may try. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, if you want to do it, you're welcome to try it, of course, too. I am speaking about it. Um, and, and you know, and that conjecture is going to sort of uh, lead lead me forward as we get to us. Yeah. Then I'm going to have a discontinuity in the talk, and I'm going to talk about how the electronic exchanges work. Pretty simplified model. The second half of the talk is going to be largely based on a really wonderful paper about to be published, I believe, was conditionally accepted in the Court of the Journal of Economics uh, by Eric Brunich. Uh, 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 Peter Preempton and uh, John Chem on um, on uh, trading in these markets and about a particular uh, arbitrage opportunity which these markets, I make a convincing case, intrinsically create and it essentially makes a tax on all of us who are investing in retirement. You know? Those high-speed traders are taking money out of the system and spending it on themselves and also on really foolish things like how fast can you transmit a signal between here and New York. Um, uh, and so I'm going to explain how it works. Then I'm going to explain the arbitrage opportunity. And I hope I don't stumble there. Remember, I'm not a trader. I don't, I don't do this for a living. Uh, so I go slowly on it. And I'll explain why it's a welfare loss, why we should think of it as a tax. Um, and then they suggest a particular uh, fix for the market. And this ties together, I would think. The fix is the change continuous trading, where you know, as soon as an order comes in, they process it if there's a match. Change it using a double auction, let's say every 100 milliseconds, every tenth of a second. 10 double auctions of, uh, a second. And, uh, and they show pretty convincingly, that kills this arbitrage. And so they're saying, gee, we should change the market. But I want to end up and talk about is well, good ways. Changing markets is hard. And there's a lot of things that they haven't modeled. 
you know, I'll talk about innate symmetry. Diagnosis is easy, because you can use a simple model to show the idiocy of the present uh, 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 market, or the, of the present institutions. But then, to say, this institution will work well, you've got to think about, you know, these wonderfully smart people who become traders and spend their life trying to figure out how you screwed up the design of that. <laughs> and it's quite likely they'll figure out something. So, you know, this is a hard, hard task. Uh, but it may be a good idea. We'll see, you know. Wait 25 years. We'll see. Uh, some people may work on it very hard. Okay. So that's, that's my preview. So let's do it. And uh, so I'm going to start with the split the difference uh, game for bilateral property. So I'm going, it's easier to talk about you're the buyer, I'm the seller, I've got the object, and you might want to buy it. Now this is what's different between, I'm really talking about double auctions the whole day. Double auction means we don't know whether we should sell it. You know, we only want to sell it if your value is greater than my, uh, my value, or I'm going to call my value the cost. Uh, you know, it's, uh, that's the only time uh, we want to sell it. In an auction, basically, the person commits uh, uh, more or less and say, I just want to get rid of the thing, you know, and the cost sort of goes away. And that makes actually the problem much easier. So here's the setup in the split the difference game. You have a value between 0 and 100. I have a cost between the 0 and 100. And, uh, <coughs> Your cost is private. I mean, uh, my cost is private to me. You don't know it. Your value is uh, a private uh, to you. Uh, I don't know it. And uh, we should only trade if, uh, whoops, got to figure out how this thing works. Uh, we should only trade, yeah, um, ah, there's the right. Yeah, I know, it's um, frustrating. And I can't get it back there. Look, I'm just talking through. Uh, if, uh, if we should only trade if your value is greater than my cost, that's basically what we want to figure out is whether that's possible. Now, in order to solve this problem, we have to have beliefs. So let's take the simplest belief. You believe my value is uniformly distributed on the 0, 100 interval. In other words, equally likely, that my value is two dollars, as ninety-eight dollars, as fifty dollars, as fifty-six dollars, as forty-nine dollars, etc. And symmetrically, I believe your cost is uh, distributed uniformly on the uh, zero one hundred uh, interval. And so you immediately think about that, and you can see only half the time we should trade. You know, because only half the time is where your value be greater than my cost. So there's a real question as whether we should trade. Then if we should trade, what should you pay me? Because uh, I'm certainly not giving it out away unless you pay me. So let's use this following real simple protocol. You and I uh, submit, ask in a bit. I write down on a piece of paper, uh, uh, I write down on a piece of paper when I'm asking. You write down a piece of paper what you're bidding. We reveal to each other what a paper says. We can verify it. If your bid is greater than my ask, we trade. If it isn't, we go away, never to see each other again. We don't get a second chance in this game. It's one shot. And have, what's the price? Well, let's say your bid is 60, and my uh, ask is 40. We've got a gain of 20 by transferring it to you. Gee, what could be more fair than splitting the difference? Let's go with a price of 50. And that's just what the formula I have up there says. We're going to split the difference on that. Now, so we trade at 50. Now, ex post after the fact, I'm going to say, Jesus, I should have, you know, I only asked uh, 48. Then, the, uh, then, you know, I would have gotten 60 minus 48. That's 12. Take the difference six, I would have gotten 54. You know, I've got a little bit of ex post regret on that. And so that says, you know, I'm going to shade things upwards to try to get a better price, but the same arithmetic works for you. So you, as a buyer, want to shade things downward. You've got an incentive, this misreport. Uh, 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 
So anyway, uh, we're going to solve for an equilibrium there. Well, we won't solve for it. I'll just describe it more accurately. So let's look at what the equilibrium uh, is in this game. So in 1983, Chatterjee and Samuelson uh, solved this game, and they discovered a linear equilibrium. Uh, and here's the equilibrium, and then it's, you know, we, this is just for purposes of an example. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're, well, let's talk about, uh, well, it's easiest, the formula is easiest for the cell. So, if my value is 100, excuse me, if my cost is 100, uh, 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 I've got to say this way. If my cost is 75, what am I going to ask? Well, 2 thirds of 75 is 50 added to 25. I'm going to ask for 75. I'm going to ask uh, for my whole uh, value. Now, I'll explain why that comes back. But if my cost was zero, if it was really a cheap supply, I just don't want the thing, what would I ask for? I would ask for 25. So when I'm asking for the 25, I'm really saying, gee, you know, I want a good bit of the gains from trade here, so I'm kind of really, you know, I'm real low, so I can ask for a high price, but this is a good probability of that. 75% that you're going to be higher, have a value higher than that, so we might as well, you know, try to shade it and to pick off some of that. Well, anyway, these are in equilibrium. It's a Bayesian-Nash equilibrium. And, you know, remember, 0 to 100 uniform distribution. So given that I'm playing a strategy 25 plus 2 thirds C, quick calculation says I'm always going to ask between 25 and 75, and it's a random variable that you're bidding, and you're bidding against. And it's uniformly <laughs> variable. And so given your value, which you know, I don't know it, you're going to do the calculation, which is, gee, if I submit an ask better than that, you know, so we trade, I want to maximize my gains from trade. And that's just the problem that I've written down here, where, you know, you maximize your bid, giving your payoff. And so, what's that payoff? It's just your value minus the price. And uh, you pick a B, it's not a hard problem to solve. Now, why is, what do I mean by a uh, Nash equilibrium, a Bayesian Nash equilibrium here? It says, if I'm playing the way I said I would, that equilibrium strategy, and you know it, and you have this idea about the distribution, uh, uh, you know, and if we played it a thousand times, each time drawing again, you know, what would you want to do? You want to follow uh, the strategy Eight and a third plus two thirds B. That would maximize. So each time you've got a new value, you want to play this uh, 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 pilot. So you've got a best response. Your B is a best response to my S. But similarly, my S is a best response to your B. And so you don't want to change because I'm doing S. And I don't want to change because you're doing B. So we just sit there. What an equilibrium means. It's like the ball comes to the rest, to rest of physics uh, at a particular point. And so that's an equilibrium. Now, question. Let's look at the properties, and we'll see that it isn't necessarily a very good equilibrium, or at least it doesn't look very good to me. Now, there's some good features about it. First, it's individually rational. You know, that turns out None of you, both of us, if you work this out, will always be betting between 25 and 75. Uh, that's where, where you know, the price will be in that, uh, in that interval. And in that interval, I will always ask for more than my cost, and you will always ask for less than your value. And that basically guarantees if we trade, each of us will come out ahead, you know. So it's individually rational. It makes sense for us to play this game. We're willing to participate. Second, it's ex post budget balance. Every time the price we trade, the price goes uh, goes down, and you know, we just trade money. We don't know it needs somebody outside of the process. You and I can play it. Nobody has to put money in. We nobody takes money out. You know, we don't have some broker taking money or something like that. And finally, 
And the bad part is, this is ex post inefficient. We're supposed to trade whenever V is greater than C. That isn't what happens. Uh, let's see equals 60, my cost, and that your V equals 75. Plug it into our formulas for the equilibrium. So I'm going to ask 65, and you're going to bid 58 and a third. No deal. But we should have had a deal. So it's inefficient. So we've got waste. And that's represented. Uh, that's represented in the graphics, that's to your right. So a vertical axis is the value, uh, your value. Horizontal axis is my value. Anything below the diagonal is where V is less than C, so we shouldn't trade. We never will, because in, down here, your bid would always be uh, less than my cost. So, you know, so here's, remember, this is true value, true cost. And we will never trade when uh, 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 your value is less than my cost. But that bright green is uh, above the diagonal is where your bid is greater than my uh, ask, so we trade there. But notice, it's just this line between trading 5 and 75, uh, you know, a uh, straight line, and it's above the diagonal. We should always trade uh, when we're above the diagonal of uh, realizations of B and C are there. And so this white area in between is the area of mistrade. It's the inefficiency of the equilibrium. That would make sense here. Anybody want to ask a question? Okay. Um, <coughs> so, two questions about that. <coughs> this is a linear equilibrium, just a bad equilibrium. You know, we solved for it. Um, you know, how, you, how it was originally solved for is, you know, you started with uniform uh, distributions and you said, maybe there's a linear equilibrium. You know, you just set it up and see whether it works. Solve for the coefficients A and B on each side, and lo and behold, it works. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing that we certainly know about the guy who came to back when this was first done, back in the early 80s, we didn't know this nearly as well, but games oftentimes have multiple equilibria. <coughs> multiple equilibria are often times. So this may just be a bad equilibrium, but maybe several equilibrium, and I was, we weren't smart enough to solve for it back then. Um, you know, perhaps it's just a remarkably inefficient equilibrium. Uh, but, the other thing is, suppose that isn't true, then we would, you know, perhaps this is a pretty good equilibrium and it's just inefficient, but it's a fault of the rules. You know, that protocol, which is, you know, we each write down the numbers, it's a different bargaining protocol uh, that generates a better, more efficient equilibrium. Now, let me tell you the reasons why you might think there isn't. So, you know, some of us have bought and sold a house, a nervous thing. Others have bought and sold a used car, which is also a nervous thing, you know, it all depends on your budget constraint. Um, and so think about this, you know, you're bargaining with me and we're trying to do it, and, you know, so let's do the used car thing, you know, it's not a very good used car thing, you know. Uh, you're offering 1800 I'm asking 2000 there's only 200 different, you know, and we've been haggling a little while, and, you know, and, uh, gee, uh, I'm saying to you, come on, you know, you know this car's worth more, but I just can't let it go for uh, anything less than 2000 What are you thinking? Is this guy trying to BS me? You know? I bet his value is less, his cost is less than that, but he let it go for. And so at some point, you're going to say, no, I'm not going lower, uh, you know, I'm not going to increase my a bit above 2,000 to let you have it. <coughs> you know, I think you should change it. And I'm thinking the same thing about you. And you know, and maybe, perhaps we should trade, but we just, you know, get stubborn, but for good reasons. Because I might be BSing you, and you might be BSing me. And, uh, you know, when you think about it that way, gee, you know, if, uh, uh, you know, if there's just a little bit of gains from trading, if, you know, I'm willing to let it go for uh, 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 2002, and you're willing to pay 2000 
uh, uh, towers, you know, but we cut in there. Uh, you know, there isn't many gains from trade. Neither of us is going to be very willing to compromise at that point, even though we should trade. He is greater than Spain. So let me show you. That's exactly right. He can't do better than that with the Russian Um <coughs> Okay, so here's mechanism design. First, I've got to show you the revelation principle, which is really a neat thing. Uh, you know, it makes everything possible. We're going to convert the linear equilibrium we just saw to a direct mechanism. What's a direct mechanism? It's where, instead of you making bids and asks, we're going to have, uh, you know, a broker, and you just say what your value is, and I say what the cost is, and then this trusted broker who doesn't cheat us would tell us whether we trade. And let's convert a linear equilibrium into a direct me mechanism. So we'll each ask what our value or cost is to a uh, 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 trustworthy broker. And what does that broker do? He takes the B and the S we have for the linear equilibrium. He plugs the V and C in there. He calculates what we would have bid. And if your, if your BV is greater than my, uh, my SC, then we trade. He announces trade, and here's the price, using the same formula we had before, and we're done. It's very simple. Now you might ask, why do we tell the truth there? Well, we tell the truth for the same reason we bid equilibrium before, you know, that neither of us can do better by lying about it, you know? And it wouldn't have been an equilibrium before uh, if this didn't work. You know, that, gee, we've just, you know, we've just asked the broker to play for us exactly what we would have done before. And now this turns out enormously simplifies and makes possible uh, setting up the problem as to how to compute uh, a, a, um, an optimal mechanism. And so here's what you do. An allocation rule just says who's going to get it. So each of us would view the C, uh, cost value. And we've got a rule that says, you know, probability one, you get it. Probability one, I get it. We'll keep it. Or maybe we flip a coin. Probability 0.5, you get it. We can mix, as we say, you know, as to who, uh, who gets it with uh, probabilities. Second thing, we need a payment rule. You know, uh, if we trade, how much do you pay me, depending on the CMB, and maybe you pay me even if we don't trade. Maybe I pay you something, you know? We're pretty unrestricted as to what we uh, uh, do that. Now, in order to, we also have to specify, you know, we're going to have to specify these beliefs. In other words, that 0 to 100 is uniform, you know, V is distributed uh, 0 to 100. Otherwise, you can't do calculations to what people would want to do. So the problem becomes one of maximizing, uh, uh, maximizing the gains from trade. And what are the gains from trade? It's just the allocation x as a function of v and c times the gains from trade, that's v minus c, and taking the expected value. That's the uh, two PDFs that are in there. And what are we maximizing over? All those possible functions of x and uh, uh, p, uh, you know, but we specified that class, you know, x is something between z uh, from 0 to 1, uh, p is just a number uh, with no constraints on it, but we have to put some constraints on it. One is incentive compatibility. The fact, g, if you report something, there isn't something that you would have liked to report. You can't do better by misreporting. And uh, otherwise, you will lie about it. <coughs> this is that respect for preferences. Uh, second, it kind of gets you to participate. So you have to, you know, just like in the original game we talked about, neither of us could ever come out. <coughs> we have to make it set up that way. And finally, third, we want to have this budget balance that we don't need somebody feeding money into the system to get us traded, or nobody is taking money out. Uh, type of a, a thing. So we solve that problem uh, and we get the optimal mechanism. And 
That's wonderful. I can use the same graphic. This is exactly the mechanism we had before. That's totally fortuitous and not, uh, not general. <clears throat> um, so we've got a we've got a mistrade region, and so on. But anyway, uh, it's exactly the same thing as before. This is the optimal mechanism. And that, you know, basically implies the following theorem that Roger Myosin and I proved back in 1983, which is uh, no mechanism, direct or otherwise, exists that always realizes all possible gains from trade, is budget balanced, and is individually rational. You have to have an efficiency. There's never a way of getting around it. Uh, okay. That's a simple case. Now, quickly, a double auction. Let's generalize it. Each of you throw in a bid when asked, depending on whether you have a share. Then what do we do? We arrange all the bids and asks from highest to lowest. And I've got M people on each side of the market, so we've got M shares. And we give those M shares for to everybody who's in the top half of the list. And then there's a dividing point where, you know, uh, you, the buyer, is the one who's just barely got a share. I'm the one, uh, a seller, who just barely sold a share. And we split the difference there to get a market clearing price. And, you know, that's a nice, simple generalization of the split the difference rule. And so if you bid more than this market clearing price, you get one. If you bid less, you don't. Now, there's some properties and some theorems. Uh, you know, you've got the same incentives to shade. But it turns out, with 1,000 people, 500 on each side, it's unlikely you're going to be that person who's right on the edge. And so your incentives to shade the price go away. And they go away very fast. And it turns out they go away linearly. That if we double the number of people, the amount that you will shade is cut in a half, basically. And, uh, you know, and it's the shading of misrevealing that causes the inefficiency. And remember, because you know, why do we trade sometimes? It's because you know, your value, my, your value is greater than my cost, but once we bet it through our bid and ask, it reversed and we didn't trade. So, uh, so you know, a second theorem is uh, that uh, this double auction and its rate of convergence uh, to efficiency, the rate of converge to efficiency is m gets large, and there's no uh, other mechanism has a faster rate. It's worst case than op optimal. Things have the worst case is just, you know, when you've got linear of these uh, uh, uniform beliefs that we've been using all along for our examples. The conjecture is, gee, if we can do that well with the static one-shot mechanism, is that when we go to continuous trading, where we trade over time, where you, if you don't trade today, can trade tomorrow, is that when the market becomes liquid enough, that there's enough people on each side and coming into the market, is that you can get efficiency in pretty well. So I want to talk about this paper <clears throat> by Budish, Crampton, and Shim, uh, which raises this issue about, uh, about a real inefficiency built in to the present algorithms for doing it. Now there's going to be three types of traders. There's liquidity providers who are dealers that carry an inventory, and they're always posting a bid and an ask. And you know, and they're willing to buy from you for a lower uh, price than they're willing to sell from. And so if I'm an investor saving uh, for retirement, you know, I can go in and buy from them, they'll happy to sell it, but if I change my mind and uh, immediately sell it back to them, they take some money, keep some money. And they make a living that way. They keep the market liquid so you can always buy. I'm an investor. And, <laughs> and finally, there's arbitragers who look across markets between New York and Chicago. And if there's a price discrepancy there, they sometimes sell in one market. At the same time, they'll buy in the other, and they make money. And they're the ones that keep New York and Chicago in line. That's why we like arbitragers. But we're going to see at least the way it's set up now, they also do some bad things uh, for the market. Now, uh, this is called the uh, continuous uh, limit order book, the way they do it. And it's very simple. 
the ask for, you know, so what happens, uh, what happens in these markets is, you know, the electronic platform, you send in an order, for, uh, it, you either trade immediately or it's put in the book, which is saying, gee, you haven't traded, but you're willing to trade. And so the ask book gives this first of the lowest ask, uh, you know, so it's the cheapest you could buy the thing, $50, and then maybe there's another ask for $50, and the next lowest ask, $51, and $53. And so when you put in an order, if, it, if uh, you've got an ask below it, you get the best price you're going to get for $50. And the bid book, exactly the opposite. You know, it's going to consist of the highest uh, bid. So if you're selling, you want the highest bid, $48. Got another one at $48. Then the next highest, $47. So you, you know, and it always, it always overlaps in this way because if we had the highest bid above uh, uh, lowest ask, they'd immediately match, and uh, we get a sale. Uh, now. You know, and as I talked about, you know, first there was that spread there, two dollars in this case, the difference between the fifty and the forty-eight, and that's what those liquidity uh, traders make their money because usually it's a liquidity trader who's provided this fifty and forty-eight uh, 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 there. So if order comes in, it's either really matched or placed in the book. If identical orders, there's just a time priority. Uh, just two examples. I'll only do one. Uh, so here's the ask book. Here's the bid book. A buyer submits a bid at fifty-one dollars. So you're saying, "Gee, I want to, I want to, uh, 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 I want to buy at fifty-one dollars." Well, gee, uh, somebody's asking fifty dollars. I'm willing to pay fifty-one. So immediately I match, and I get it for fifty dollars. And if it had matched, my $51 would have gone into the book. And that's the second example uh, uh, does that. But, you know, so the book keeps track of these things. Important thing is, as soon as it comes in, it can get matched right away. So here's the arbitrage opportunity we get into a problem with. Uh, the time is exactly noon down to the millisecond. And in Chicago, you know, in Chicago, you know, the uh, 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 lowest ask is fifty, and uh, the lower and uh, the highest bid is forty-six. You know, so there's a spread, uh, a spread of four. In New York, it's about the same: it's forty-nine for the highest ask, and forty-seven for the lowest bid. Now, something happens in Chicago. You know, somebody says, gee, you know, this stuff is really valuable, and a big order comes in, and the market immediately adjusts. It jumps up in Chicago. And now the lowest uh, ask is 58. Uh, you know, it's kind of expensive to buy in Chicago, but they'll buy, pay a lot in Chicago. They'll buy a 53. So if you're an arbitrager, and you see this, you're sitting in Chicago and you see this, you say, gee willikers, what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy a 49 in New York. Because, you know, so you immediately send an order, instantaneously. Computers are fast, because this is all automated. You spend it, you're going to send an order to New York to buy a 49 and simultaneously uh, sell in Chicago at 53. But meanwhile, there's the poor sucker in 49 who posted that <laughs> at 49, and he said, oh, Jesus, you know, he, you know, and he's got a representative in Chicago, too, and that representative instantly also tries to cancel this order. Because remember, you can cancel it. So it's a race to cancel versus buy. Sometimes you cancel uh, successfully, but oftentimes the other guys beat you. And if you're beaten, what happens? Gee, you you know you just basically lost four dollars on that share. Now you know you've got you, if you don't make a living, you don't stay a liquidity trader. So this is one of your costs when you get beaten by the arbitrages. How do you make? <coughs> what does this mean? 
you have to basically insure yourself by having that bigger spread so you make more money from us investors. And that is why it's inefficient. You know, these arbitrages cause it to be more expensive to be a liquidity trader. Since it's more expensive to be a liquidity trader, you have to have a bigger spread when you deal with pigeons like us who just send in orders. And, uh, you know, if we're taking money out of the system, uh, that's inefficient. They get to build their mansion uh, out in Newport like they used to or whatever they want to do. And, you know, we keep plodding away here in academia. Uh, uh, but anyway, and, uh, uh, you know, and this slide's just what I said. This causes inefficiency. So, what generates these opportunities? And this is where the physics comes in. How long does it take for the speed of light to go between sh Chicago and New York? Four milliseconds. When news hits in Chicago, New York doesn't know it. And, you know, and that's what gives a chance, you know, who moves fastest and gets the trade in New York first. And, uh, you know, the arbitrageurs actually have spent, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars speeding up communications between places. It's, uh, it's worthwhile. It's an arms race type of thing. Now, think about this is, you know, over, looks, uh, why, but why do these arbitrage opportunities come up? Well, the first on the left, the panel shows, uh, shows the price path over a one minute period. Because of all this arbitrage, we can't have price differences ex last for long. We have almost perfect correlation. And if you look over a day or a year, you know, the graph gets shifts, you just can't tell the two price paths together. But when you get down to 250 milliseconds, it takes, arbitrage takes time. News arrives one place, and your one player, the other place doesn't know. So you can see the correlation breaking down. And then the four milliseconds, it's just impossible for New York to know what happened in Chicago. Uh, uh, you know, in that amount of time. You know, it just can't be relativity. Uh, uh, and so things become uncorrelated. And, you know, once you hear this, you say, of course it has to be uncorrelated if there is a small time limit. But Sometimes there's a jump in that period, and that creates an arbitrage opportunity. And the particular stocks uh, people that are looked at here, uh, two stocks that are basically two, two securities that track the Standard & Poor's 500 index, uh, uh, there's about 80 arbitrage uh, opportunities a day. They're not trivial. And the estimates they have is that just on this between these two exchanges on this one security, they pick up about 75 million a year, and they think that's a conservative estimate. Uh, estimate. So that's worthwhile money. Um, okay, so it's this lack of correlation at very short time periods that guarantees this arbitrage will be, opportunities will be there, and they make money from it. And it guarantees that this is a significant tax on us investors. Okay. Of course, you know, you can always become a finance person and become one of them. Uh, now, here's a proposed re a remedy that uh, uh, Boothish, Crampton, and Schimmer said. Gee, get rid of continuous trading. Every 100 milliseconds, have a double auction. Remember, the double auction has fabulous properties of convergence, and moreover, you know, if the market's reasonably uh, reasonably thick, you don't even misrepresent. You know, it gets you to tell the truth uh, as a practical matter. And you're going to have a new uh, double auction every 100 milliseconds. It works like this. You send in a trade doing this 100 milliseconds in order. Nothing happens. It just goes into the book. It is not revealed to anybody that you put it in. You know, that just remains private to you. So each of us send it in, the clock uh, ticks to 100 milliseconds, then they kind of slam down the gate right then and say, here's the book, we're going to compute the market clearing price, trade takes place, and remember, the static double auction does that very, very well. And also, as I want to shade 
that I tell you, it also kills the arbitrage opportunity. Let me show you that. More clarifying. How do you deal with the, the asynchronous flow of information? Where does this happen? And does it matter? Uh, each, uh, each exchange would do it itself. Okay. You know, you know, they can't beat that problem. Okay. You know, and well, you know, the prices will still equalize. The details of that have not been worked out. I'm going to get to that. Okay. But anyway, any other clarifying questions about this? You know. So what's the idea that I just said that built in to the standard continuous market is these arbitrage opportunities. They come from the fact is that New York can't know the same things in Chicago <laughs> in very short time frames and vice versa. And so things become uncorrelated, that creates arbitrage opportunities and there's an honest race to take advantage. But now into this new market design, what happens? Uh, gee, this fails. The news causing the Chicago uh, crowds to jump. Suppose that happens 50 milliseconds into this 100 millisecond interval between officers. So the arbitrage of sense has been to buy the low New York task at millisecond 50. It arrives at, let's say, uh, at millisecond 55. He's got really good communications. Uh, you know, almost the speed of light. And so, you know, and, you know, the person who posted it, he, he sends a message to cancer, and it doesn't arrive to millisecond 57. Has he lost his four hours? No, because nothing happens. Both go into the book. When his 57 hits, and says, when his order to cancel hits, that ask or bid, whatever it was, I've got to confuse and forget, but anyway, whatever he was going to be taken advantage of disappears, it's canceled, and so when the 100 second clock uh, goes away, and we have the auction, the arbitrager doesn't get the match. He's out. Now, and you can see that this works really, really well. It prevents almost arbitrage. Possible, but very hard under the frequent batch double auction. The news had arrived in Chicago at millisecond 94, then what would have happened? The arbitrage would have gotten his order to buy there at 99. At 100, the market would have closed. And, and, at, uh, and at 101, the order to cancel would have applied. Nothing to cancel. A stock had been sold. And you would lose. Like you, you know, there's basically only a two second interval each hundred a second two millisecond interval out of every hundred seconds where this works. You get rid of 98% of the arbitrage opportunities. Pretty darn good. <coughs> Any questions? Oh. Why not, why not make the trading period longer or get rid of more? That is an unanswered question. And uh, we don't have a good theory on that. There's lots of work to be done here in my opinion. And so here's some thoughts on the new future. Will this become the standard for security exchanges as proposal? Well, gee, this is a very convincing argument that the one we have has a serious problem, but we do not know whether this would actually work better. I mean, you know, law of unintended consequences. We get rid of one thing and introduce something else that's a problem. Now, in principle, we can calculate and I think in practice, too, we can do a pretty good job of saying, gee, in a continuous uh, market like this, where, you know, traders come in, you know, we can model this and do exactly what we did in the case of uh, uh, the split the difference bilateral bargaining. You say, gee, do we get something that converges, particularly in how, you know, and what's it matter how long we have between the intervals? But, you know, there, if we want to make that prediction, We've got to do something. We've got to put incomplete information in the fact that you and I don't know each other's values. This demonstration that this arbitrage opportunities, we didn't use any of that incomplete information. We could simplify it, and it did affect the logic. But if we want to propose changing the system, we have to model it far more accurately, and that becomes much, much harder. Uh, you know, so there's a real asymmetry here. Diagnosis is easier than prediction. You know, you can say that's a problem of fixing it, you know, because of the law of unintended consequences is much, much harder. 
Uh, and then there's all the realities of uh, institutional uh, design. We, you know, we've got mechanism design theory, but you know, we've also got behavioral decision theory where we don't quite, you know, we aren't very good at maximizing, so we want to actually adjust uh, for that. You know, we may have to use numerical uh, uh, methods in order to solve for an equilibrium of this thing when we model it correctly. That's not terribly easy. Uh, we may want to do some lab experiments where we have model markets like this. We will do those sorts of things to see how it works. Kids sometimes figure out very novel strategies that we would have never figured out. And family, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, <coughs> maybe one of you, particularly a grad student in this room, would decide to go into finance and say, Jesus, I've looked at this theory, let's start a market and see how it flies, particularly with somebody else's money, venture capital money. Uh, <laughs> and uh, see whether it works. And you know, and that's not an unlikely thing. There's something called black pools, which in recent years have become a very important part of the market, which are basically exchanges, which you can't see inside of as much as you can see inside of the New York Stock Exchange, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So maybe, you know. And then if you're gonna convince the Mercantile Exchange or the New York Stock Exchange to do the change, you're gonna have to do a lot of persuading, a lot of talking, a lot of political horse trading, et cetera. It's very hard. Now, Al Roth, um, an economist now at Stanford, who's worked on matching problems, particularly for very interested in recent years of kidney transfer. He's been working with the doctors who make those allocation decisions for years to try to get them to see that there's a huge inefficiency there and that there are better mechanisms to do. And he is making incremental process but progress, but there's a long ways to go. Uh, so anyway, it's hard, but we've got tools. <laughs>